So, hi everyone, and thanks for joining us today for the LFD colloquium. Uh, so you will be muted during the call, but feel free to write any question that you might have in the chat and we get back to them. But eventually at the end of the talk, you will get the chance to ask your questions uh, in person if you prefer to ask it that way, just, just keep it in mind. And uh, so, and the, the, the webinar will be recorded and will be shared with you later. So the talk of today, we have Camille Dupro from uh, Ecole Polytechnique in France, who's actually joining us from Princeton today, where she is currently on sabbatical. And her research is focused on fibers and especially their interaction with fluid flows, viscous flows and interfaces and especially in the context of textile, which I believe is going to be the focus of also her talk today. So hand over to Camille. Yeah. Hi, <laughs> thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so yes, uh, today I want to talk to you about textiles. And actually, um, there's a lot of uh, very interesting topics in textiles and a lot of fluid mechanics and soft matter. Uh, questions which are relevant uh, to textiles and um, I'm going to try to give you a very quick overview on these questions and I just uh, published an annual review uh, on that topic so at the beginning of this year so if you're interested you can look uh, into it but uh, it starts with very simple questions which are actually less simple than it seems so for example just how a drop spreads on a textile is a very complex system because we have a very um, multi-scale uh, issues and the yarn is made of individual filaments and as liquid spreads it will spread in between the filaments of the yarn, in between the yarns, uh, as well as inside uh, the fibers themselves. And you can have, for example, here to an image of a drop blood which is uh, as splattered on the textile and you see that it actually imbibes faster in the warp direction in the warp direction uh, because of the tension uh, within the weave that change uh, the shape of the yarn. So it's a very uh, complex and interesting question. As I said, the liquid can not only uh, weak uh, in the porous materials that the textile is, but it can also uh, get inside the fibers because most of the fibers that we use either uh, cotton, for example, in uh, clothes, but also cellulose in paper or in filters or in uh, face masks, um, is uh, absorbs uh, water and can swell. And so there's lots of questions associated with the swelling of individual fibers and how that will change uh, the behavior and uh, of the uh, textile itself, which is something that I will talk about uh, today. Um, the fibers themselves are very long uh, objects, elongated objects that are generally quite thin and, and long and that makes them highly flexible and they're flexible enough that uh, at the scale that we're looking at they can be deformed by surface tension and a good example of that is that if you try to uh, thread uh, a needle, to, to place a thread in a needle, you will moist uh, the end of the thread in order to uh, uh, stick all the bristle of the of the yarn together and that will give you more strength and then you can actually uh, put it inside the needle. That's something that you uh, experience every day and this is a, a balance between capillary forces that are sticking uh, the, uh, the different uh, filaments together and elasticity uh, that uh, resists this deformation. And these elastocapillary uh, effects uh, can, can be seen in uh, many different things. It, in mundane um, applications that, that if you're trying to dry uh, textile, if you uh, dry it inline, uh, you will have something which is quite stiff because uh, again the capillary forces associated with the liquid uh, air interfaces that appear during drying will tend to bring uh, the fibers together. But if you uh, dry in a tumble dry, instead you will have something much more soft because you've broken up all the capillary bridges and you've removed this effect. So you have here a very clear everyday signature of these elastocapillary problems. Um, this shrinkage is, or this um, collapse of fiber with capillary forces is actually what allows you to make paper, uh, because as you might know, paper is made of a suspension of flexible fibers that are uh, put together, the water is drained out and dried, and all the contacts which are established between the fibers, thanks to these capillary forces, are the reason why you have some uh, strength uh, in a, in your, inside your uh, uh, sheet of paper. Uh, you've all also become very familiar with the fact that you can use fibers to 
uh, stop aerosol. Uh, so this uh, we've known uh, very well uh, now that you can stop very tiny droplets with a porous material uh, such as textile, and these are very good because you have uh, you can have something which is very porous, and so you can breathe through it, or it's very permeable, uh, but still has a lot of obstacle uh, on which the droplets can uh, impact and uh, being captured. And that's something that has been used for a very long time to collect water from fog, uh, either for meteorological measurements. So here we have pictures of fog gauges, but also to harvest fresh water in regions where fog is abundant. And I will maybe uh, very briefly talk about it uh, also at the end of the talk. So you've seen I've only uh, selected a few examples, uh, but there are many more. And as all of them, uh, you can start to think about them by looking at the interaction of just one single drop uh, with a single fiber, uh, which turns out to be a little uh, more complex than also just putting a drop on a fiber. And so in order to study this, uh, all these problems, we've decided to go to more model system. And the one I will talk to you about is things that we've done with my PhD student, Pierre Van de Velde, and in collaboration with uh, my uh, great collaborator, Suzy Protier and uh, Julien Dervaux. And the uh, fibers that we use are um, uh, model gel fibers. They are actually um, silicon elastomer. So we use uh, either uh, polyvinyl siloxane or PDMS, uh, that some of you might know. Um, and as a solvent, we use silicon oils. So those are um, fibers that we can mold um, but just by injecting this polymer solution into a capillary tube. And we form fibers of a few hundreds of microns in a diameter and a length of a centimeter. And if we place one of these fibers in the bath of oil, this is a picture that you have here, it will uh, absorb the oil and swell, uh, as you can see. And the swelling is isotropic. It will swell as much in the length as it swells in the diameter. And uh, we can define a swelling ratio, which is uh, the ratio of the lengths, uh, the growing lengths to the uh, initial lengths or the growing radius to the initial radius. And the fibers that uh, we use have typically a maximum swelling of uh, 1.5, that means they, they grow by 50%. If we look at the dynamic of this swelling, uh, we have something which is quite, uh, which is uh, somehow exponential, not exactly exponential but resemble an exponential with a typical time scale uh, T swell, which will uh, depend, which is of a few uh, hundreds or thousands of seconds um, uh, and is um, it will depend strongly on the size of the fiber, on the radius R of the fiber, but also on a pseudo diffusive coefficient um, that uh, characterize how well the solvent uh, goes into the fiber. And so this, uh, effective diffusion uh, coefficient can be seen if you look at uh, uh, poroelastic uh, theory as something which will depend on the uh, young modulus of the fiber E, um, but also on the permeability uh, of the uh, fiber K and will depend also on the viscosity um, of the liquids. And so uh, with the system that we used, we have typical diffusion coefficients uh, of uh, 10 to the minus 10 uh, meters square per second. Uh, we can only slightly vary this, um, this co coefficient, and that's uh, because if we change the uh, properties of the elastomers that we use, let's say the uh, chain lengths, we will both decrease the young modulus, uh, for instance, and increase the permeability. So both, um, we always have a uh, constant uh, diffusion coefficient. So uh, this swelling uh, time scale is mostly dependent on the geometry. You've seen it depends a lot on the size uh, of the fiber, but that will give you absorption time of uh, a few minutes in general. So if you take a block of this uh, polymer and you place a uh, four microliter droplet on it, uh, it will spread and being absorbed um, by the polymer, which will swell a little bit uh, with a time of about one minute. So now the question is, what happens if we do the exact same experiments, but on a fiber? So I will take exactly the same material um, and the same uh, liquids and the same volume of droplets. But now instead of having a substrate, a flat substrate, I will make it into a fiber of reduced 250 micron. So I place a drop on it. You see the drop is hanging a little bit because there's a gravitational effect. And uh, we'll look at how uh, the liquid is absorbed inside the fiber. So you see that the liquid gets absorbed. The fiber is swollen locally where the drop is. Um, it will slowly uh, being 
completely absorb and you will end up with a swollen region uh, that will then very slowly diffuse in time and if you wait long enough you will have uniformly uh, swollen uh, fiber but here's a movie that i'm showing you uh, has been accelerated 200 times and the absorption time is of uh, 15 hours um, which uh, is uh, much longer than the minutes that we had just before so we have a very strong increase of the of the absorption time and we can look into that into a little more detail. So here I, I plot the height of the job as a function of time, which is a way of measuring how much liquid has been absorbed uh, within the fiber. And the different colors corresponds to different initial volume. So we can start with low volumes, uh, at uh, which has a dark blue curves here, and the picture here on the left, uh, where you see that a small job is very quickly absorbed uh, into uh, the fiber with somehow also an exponential uh, decrease of the heights uh, as we've seen for the fully immersed uh, droplet. And then you can see that as we increase uh, the volume, it starts seeing again a, a quick initial rapid um, uh, quick uh, swelling, which is followed by a much longer, slower uh, region where the job is just slowly absorbing in time and if we change just slightly the volume we can uh, increase uh, the time by a, a factor of 10 or, or even more the time to be absorbed up to uh, several hours so in order to understand this uh, we have to look at what is the shape of a drop on the fiber because indeed this uh, very uh, long uh, time corresponds to the time that uh, the drop has to um, absorb onto ooh, maybe okay now it works <laughs> um the ma main difference between uh, the drop on the substrate and the drop on the fiber is that the drop on the substrate uh, we had seen was spreading around but the drop on the fiber doesn't spread it remains as a compact droplet and so as uh, at the beginning it will just quickly uh, absorb below it uh, and then the region below the drop is completely saturated with solvent and the only way to absorb more will be to slowly diffuse uh, on the edges which explains its very long uh, absorption time. So uh, I just told you that a drop on the fiber doesn't spread so everything that I will talk about today is in uh, total wetting so if we were on the plane, uh, we will completely spread out, uh, but on the fiber, due to the curvature of the fiber, the drops uh, remain compact and even in perfect wetting, adopt this spherical shape. And uh, this spherical shape has been very well um, studied and characterized and in particular by Carol in the 70s, and we know exactly how to describe this shape. Uh, it's not that's obvious when we have gravitational effects and actually only very recently in 2021 uh, a group actually here in Princeton um, tried to develop an analytical solution for a drop hanging with gravity on the fiber um, but it's uh, it's still a work in progress and it's not that obvious what the shape should be so what my student Pierre did instead was to measure uh, the shape of the drop for different uh, volume on different uh, fibers. So we measure the volume very accurately by uh, weighting uh, on the precision scale and we measure the height uh, for different uh, volume and we get a relationship between the height and the length of the droplet as a function of volume and empirical uh, description of this shape. Uh, so that's the plot that you have here. So the, the lines, uh, the plane lines are the lines that you will get without gravity and we see that we have some gravitational effects uh, above a large for large volumes where we start hanging uh, below uh, the drop the fiber so we have a relationship between the height and the volume of the drop and so we can now convert our uh, previous plot which was the height as a function of time as a height as a function of uh, volume and so we know that uh, we will start uh, here on a dry fiber um, and then as the fiber gets swollen, it changes radius, which changes a little bit the shape uh, of the drop, which is slightly dependent on the radius. So we start with a drop on a dry fiber, which has is this compact shape. And then very quickly, the liquid, it's like, it's like everything which is below the drop is uh, immersed in solvent. So it will uh, swell uh, quickly just below the drop, um, which is given by the points that you can see here. So we end up being on the on curve corresponding to the swollen fiber. 
And then the liquid cannot uh, absorb more in that region, so it has to slowly diffuse out uh, through the edges. And we assume that this diffusion occurs with the pseudo diffusive coefficient that we have seen before. So uh, with a length that will increase as a uh, radius, as a square root of time. And that will, uh, and so that the volume that has to be absorbed is called V tilde. And is the volume that is left in the job after this very quick first absorption. So we have these two phases, uh, a very quick absorption below the drop and then this very slow uh, diffusion. And we can define a critical volume above which uh, all the drop, there's uh, some volume left in the drop after the quick absorption. So now if we want to try to estimate the time for the drop to be absorbed, uh, we have the sum of these two times, so the rapid swelling, which is this T-swell I told you about, the characteristic uh, swelling time, and then a much slower uh, diffusion time that will depend on how much volume is left in the drop and will depend on a diffusion coefficient. And we end up having this uh, evolution of the absorption time as a function of the volume, initial volume of the drop. So below uh, this critical volume V star, we have a very uh, short absorption time, almost constant. And then we have this very rapid increase uh, of absorption time with volume, um, which uh, volume actually square, um, that uh, correspond to these very long uh, experiments. So um, in all of these, I've, uh, we've treated everything as if it were diffusive-like, and it's pretty good to estimate the absorption time. But the material that we're using is a poroelastic material, so it's a little more complex. And one of the things that I didn't tell you about is that everything will depend also on the stresses that develop inside the material. And actually, the maximum amount of liquid that can be absorbed uh, by the fibers is lambda, uh, uh, which we can express also at the uh, maximum concentration of solvents that can exist in the material, will depend not only on the modulus and the permeability uh, of the material, which are represented here by the bulk modulus uh, G, the molar volume of the solvent omega and the poroelastic uh, Poisson ratio nu, but it will also depend in the stress in the actual direction. Um, and this uh, stress is actually the tension that we apply to the fiber. So if we pull more on the fiber, we can actually absorb more liquids. So the more tension, the more liquid you can absorb. And this will become important for the rest of my talk. Uh, so you just have to think of, yeah, if I pull on it, then I can have more solvents coming in. Um, so that means that the tension is important. But in the experiment that we're doing, we're, keep, we're keeping the length of the fiber constant and everything is swelling. So actually during the experiment, the tension is changing uh, within the fiber. And one way of seeing this is by measuring the tension. So we um, attached the fiber to a force sensor on one side and we clamp it on the other side and we measure the tension as the drop is being absorbed. And you can see that the tension is actually decreasing as the time increases, and that's because since we're swelling, uh, we're increasing the length of the fiber, but the length is constrained to a fixed position, and so we have to release uh, the tension within the fiber. Uh, you can also see on the on the plot here of the tension that it clearly uh, quick it clearly follows the absorption dynamics with this rapid um, or quick um, uh, exponential uh, decreases, and then this slow diffusing. And we have a, a direct correlation between the absorption dynamics and the decrease in tension. So that's something to keep in mind. As the liquid is swelling the fiber, it's also decreasing the tension within the fiber, which will change all the um, equilibrium uh, concentrations uh, in the fiber. And that is actually important uh, when we start having more complex systems, such as placing two uh, droplets on the fiber. Um, so here in the first experiment, we have the same exact fiber, we have the same uh, droplets, and which we place two of them on the fiber. And so each of them will start to swell. We have these swollen regions that are growing. And if we wait a little bit, we start seeing some motion of one of the fibers, some kind of spontaneous motion. And then we have this uh, spontaneous coalescence uh, of the two drop. Um, one of the, I will go back to explain this uh, experiment. But one of the consequences of uh, this is that we've 
even uh, decrease uh, the possibility of, uh, of uh, saturating the fiber below it. So that the absorption time is now 60 hours, which also, uh, you know, test the patience of my PhD students. Um, but we have very long absorption time now. So uh, in order to understand this spontaneous coalescence, we can look at this second experiments where the, fiber, the droplets are a little bit further apart. And so we clearly see the two independent, I'm going to pause here, the two independent swollen region uh, below the droplets. And you see, you, will, you can look at the center in between the droplets where it's initially uh, dry, let's say, or there's no uh, solvent inside. And you see that these two regions are merging. And as they're merging, you start seeing that some liquid is coming out actually of the fiber at the center. Uh, and growing into a drop. So what we uh, didn't see in the first movie, but was happening is that there was some liquid coming out of the fiber at the center. And this liquid was bridging the two droplets and uh, forced the coalescence between the two droplets. So now uh, the question is, why do we have liquid coming out of the fiber while uh, it's a, a favorable solvent and it just wants to swell the fiber? So we can look into that with a little sketch. So we start with uh, to droplets, we have an initial state where we've applied attention to the uh, fiber T uh, knot, and uh, the liquid is swelling. We uh, form this uh, saturated swollen region at the center, um, and we have now a tension T1. But the liquid is still being absorbed uh, on the side, and so we have, since we're absorbing the liquid, we're decreasing the tension. And as we're decreasing the tension, the center, which is saturated, becomes out of equilibrium. As I told you, if we decrease the tension, we decrease the amount of liquid that we can keep. And so the center is now out of equilibrium and the liquid has to go somewhere. So it has two choices. It can actually travel all along and exit by the edges, or there is a possibility of the liquid coming out of the fiber, which, uh, what we call deswelling. And we believe that this deswelling is more favorable than uh, traveling all the way uh, to the edges. Then once this uh, drop is out uh, of the fiber, it can bridge the two other ones and lead to interactions and coalescence as we've seen. So um, now we wanted to make sure that we understood that this deswelling was really indeed this uh, um, balance between saturation at a given tension and then decrease of tension. And uh, one way we can uh, be a little more convinced about that is by doing these experiments where we've applied a large tension to a fiber, we've immersed it into liquids, uh, it's fully swollen with the liquids, and we're now gonna release uh, the tension to see what's happening. So it's fully swollen and we release the tension and we see that uh, liquid is coming out with several droplets. So there is indeed the possibility of this winning if a saturated material, uh, we decrease the tension suddenly. Um, we can also even go a little further by doing a linear poroelastic model that takes into account all these effects that I've told you about with a few assumptions. So we first assume uh, linear uh, and small deformations, and we will assume that the concentrations are homogeneous in the radial direction. So we see everything is uh, constant uh, within the diameter of the fiber, which is an okay approximation. Um, we then can models the evolution of the concentration of solvents within the fiber. Uh, and then we'll have the sum of uh, diffusion of solvents and with two source terms, which are the two droplets. And here we see again this uh, maximum concentration that, as you remember, will depend on the tension. So we can model the, the experiments. Uh, and one of the things that we can measure, for instance, is uh, tension within the fiber. And we see that indeed the tension uh, decreases uh, with time, as we've seen uh, experimentally with this uh, first quick uh, decrease and then this lower uh, diffusing like uh, behavior. And we can do this for a single drop or for two droplets. And we see a very uh, a similar decrease in tension. One of the things that we can do with this model is uh, look at uh, the radius at in between the two uh, droplets. So if we, uh, which we can plot here, so this is the evolution of the radius as a function of time. In between the droplets are the blue lines and the red line indicates what is the maximum radius. And this maximum radius uh, slowly decreases with time as the tension uh, decreases with time. So if we look at droplets which are far from uh, one another, 
like here, so large uh, D knots, we see that each droplet is swelling individually and the center uh, between the two drops uh, never reach saturation. Uh, so that we do not expect any interaction between the droplets. However, if the droplets are closer to one another, uh, the center, the radius at the center will quickly reach saturation and can actually overshoot uh, the maximum radius, which in the experiments is, uh, will lead to this uh, de-swelling uh, here. And so we can, uh, from the model, obtain the time T star at which we expect these uh, two radius to cross over so that the radius of the is out of equilibrium, which will lead to de-swelling in the experiment. So we can now uh, build a phase diagram of what we observe and we'll place it as a function of the distance between the droplets d nuts, which we will compare to this uh, swollen uh, length, which will be the length of uh, the swollen region after the drop is absorbed. Uh, so that if this nut is larger than L swollen, then there will be no deswelling, which are the red points uh, that you see here in the graph. And if uh, it is uh, smaller, you can have some deswelling, which are the triangles uh, that you see here. So as I said, uh, below when D-nut is larger than L swollen, we only have these two independent uh, swollen regions and we don't see any deswelling. We have another limit, um, which is indicated here by the yellow line, which will uh, be the limit that the droplet, the distance between the droplets is smaller than the length of an individual droplet. So as we place them on the fibers, they will just directly coalesce. Now, uh, in order to understand the limits between the no deswelling and the deswelling, what we do is uh, numerically, we can extract, as I told you, the time uh, at which we expect this overshoot to happen. And uh, we can compute the volume left in the drop at uh, this time. So if this volume is non-zero, that means that there's still the possibility of liquid to come out um, of, the, of the fibers, which is given by the colored region here. And we see that this criteria actually very well uh, describes the limit between the no deswelling and the deswelling observed in the experiment. So that indeed this deswelling is due to the fact that, that we saturate the uh, center with liquid, we decrease the tension enough that liquid wants to come out. And so we have a, a good agreement uh, in our phase diagram. So if I wanna uh, summarize this a little bit, uh, we see that we can have uh, deswelling and spontaneous motion if we have both saturation locally and uh, decrease in tension, which is a global effect. And that means that we can have uh, quite long range interactions. So here's the experiment, which is done here. You have here the time is uh, passing by. We have this movie is quite accelerated. Uh, we place two drop in the region of the phase diagram where they should not have any deswelling. So just above the limits uh, here, just above the red uh, dotted line limit. And uh, so the droplets are just here, they're swelling and they're just slowly diffusing. Uh, not much is happening. Um, and we left the movie long enough to convince you that uh, nothing should be happening. And what we're going to do is uh, decrease the tension within the fibers. And we can do that by adding a few droplets and adding some swelling. Uh, so what uh, Pierre did is that now he will add some droplets on the side of the fiber at uh, one point. I think towards the end. <laughs> Uh, it will quickly add droplets far away, uh, as, yeah, far away from uh, from the uh, initial saturated region, and this will uh, lead to a very quick coalescence of the two drop at the center. So that tells you that indeed we need to have a saturated region, and as soon as the tension is decreased, we can have this uh, spontaneous coalescence here at the center, which is. Uh, due to this deswelling. And it also tells you that we can have complex motions if we think now of a textile, because uh, something that's happening even far away from a saturated region can lead to motion um, with a long-range interaction. Um, so if we want to summarize a little bit uh, what uh, we had seen up until now, we can ask the question, how fast is a job absorbed by a textile, first by a fiber? And we've seen that uh, due to a saturation, um, of, the, of the liquid below the droplets, and that's due to the fact that a drop on the fiber doesn't want to spread but remain compact. 
we can have a very long absorption time of about 15 hours. Uh, we've seen that if you have several droplets, those droplets can interact and actually uh, coalesce uh, thanks to a release of tension that creates some deswelling. And that will even uh, increase the absorption time more because it reduces the, the uh, amount of dry fiber that the drop can see. Now, in the textile, we generally don't have one fiber, but uh, several fibers. And so if we now uh, place a drop on two fibers, which is its bottom movie here, we're going to have um, more uh, surface of contact between the liquid and the fibers. And so we can have a shorter absorption time of about more like an, an hour, as you can see here. And uh, we can also have, if we change a little bit, let's say the distance between the fiber or the tension between the fiber, but I will come to this more uh, in detail a little after, we can have even shorter time. So in this movie, we've uh, changed slightly the behavior and you see that at one point the drop spreads, uh, so it encounters a lot of dry fiber and absorption time is now only a few hundred of seconds. And uh, we can even decrease this time dramatically uh, if we, uh, let's say, decrease the distance between the uh, fiber where we now have this very large spreading and an absorption time of uh, about a minute. Um, this is actually relevant to the uh, textile um, uh, literature or textile behavior. And very recently, there was a paper um, published on printing or dyeing of uh, cotton uh, fabric. And they looked at uh, the absorption time or absorption dynamic of a single drop of dye on a single cotton fiber. And it takes about uh, one second. And they did it uh, the same on the yarn. And then the absorption time is now 0.3 milliseconds. So there's a factor of 5,000 between the absorption of a single drop and the drop uh, inside the yarn. Exactly like what we've seen with our experiment is that in the yarn, the drop can actually spread in between the filaments and that uh, drastically reduces uh, the absorption time. So um, now I can uh, tell you more about why does the drop spread in between the uh, uh, yarn. And that's something that we had studied quite some time ago, uh, but that we've uh, revisited a little bit uh, recently, which is that if you place a droplet on two fibers, two parallel fibers, it can adopt two shapes. Uh, so either this compact drop shape, like you will have on a single fiber, uh, but if you bring the fiber close enough, uh, this drop shape spread as a long liquid column, and you have uh, so these two states uh, with a quite strong hysteretic uh, loop, uh, which you can plot here as this phase diagram as a function of the distance between the fibers that I will call D, normalized by the radius of a single fiber R, and the volume of uh, a droplet, which is here normalized by the radius uh, to the power of three. And you see that you can have droplets at high distance between the fibers, column at a uh, small distance between the fibers, and you have a region uh, where both the states exist due to this uh, hysteretic loop which is what I'm going to talk to you a little more in details now. So um, this is something that I was studied a long time ago in the 70s by uh, Princeton that studied actually this column shape uh, and showed that there was a universal shape for this column, which is uh, just a minimization of the surface of, uh, of liquid, uh, which can be represented here by the radius of curvature of uh, the column R, as well as the spreading angle or the angle alpha uh, along the fiber on which uh, the liquid is spreading. And as you change the distance between the fibers, you both change the angle alpha and the radius of curvature uh, of the column to go from at small distances um, uh, convex column, uh, which is confined in between the fibers, uh, to a concave column or round column, which is spreading all around the fibers. And there are two interesting uh, distances, which are here given again in perfect wetting, um, which are the maximum columns that you can form, which is when uh, angle alpha reaches uh, uh, pi. And this uh, is given by a, radius, a distance between the fiber, which is exactly square root of two uh, times the radius of the fiber. So here you use tilde to plot uh, non-dimensional variables and everything is made uh, non-dimensional using the radius of the fiber, which is the only length scale in our system. Um, 
So we have this maximum radius above which you cannot form any column. And there is another critical distance, which is um, given by, which is around 0 0.6, 0 0.57, or pi over 2 minus 1, uh, which is a distance at which the column is completely flat and reaches uh, half the size of the droplet. So this is a flat column. The moment where the radius of curvature change sign. Um, and so you have this universal column shape, uh, which we've uh, measured by if you plot the length of the column as a function of the distance between the fiber, you clearly see that you have um, a shape, a universal shape, whatever the volume of the droplet is, that corresponds uh, to these columns, first uh, convex, then to uh, this concave column, and that above this value of 1.4, you never form any columns and you only have droplets. Now, this critical distance uh, DC was observed uh, again a long time ago uh, in the textile uh, literature as it is a, a critical distance between two fibers at which liquid will start to weak in between the fibers. So if I place two fibers in contact with a liquid bath, the liquid will not rise in between the fibers until we reach this distance of 0 0.6 times the radius at which we will start to move. And this was uh, cleverly shown by an experiment by Pierre Brice Bantin in uh, 2015, where he did a conical shape, uh, so a wedge made of two fibers. And you see that the liquid, uh, uh, and put it in contact with a liquid bath, and you see that the liquid will imbibe until it reaches this critical distance, which can then uh, be accurately measured uh, to be uh, 0.57. Now, as you recall from our graph here, we had seen uh, droplets for values of uh, the distance, which is much higher than this 0 0.57, which means that we can form columns uh, even in uh, a region of these uh, con concave columns. And uh, we can understand this uh, a little more by looking at this movie where we have a droplet. Uh, we start with a large distance between the fibers and we're going to bring the fibers close together. So if we bring them close to this critical distance of 0 0.6, indeed, we see uh, this spreading. But if we bring them uh, to a distance which is a little higher, we again see some spreading. And even to distances which are uh, close to 1, we uh, have spreading over a smaller column, but we still have this spreading. And that's because uh, here's a difference of pressure that we need to worry about to uh, have wicking is not between a bus at a uh, constant atmospheric pressure, which will correspond to this flat interface, but is a droplet. And so now we have to worry between the difference of, curve of Laplace pressure between a droplet of a given radius and, uh, and the column. And that means that we can and both have wicking if we have a different sign of curvature, but also if we have a curvature in the same sign, but just a different magnitude of the curvature. And now we can uh, model this wicking uh, behavior by just assuming a, a, a Darcy law. So we have a porous material made of a single pore uh, with the permeability that we assume is uh, proportional to the um, cross-sectional area A uh, of the liquid in between the fibers. Uh, so that will give us our permeability. And the difference of pressure is the difference of Lap Laplace pressure between the drop of radius RT and the column of radius uh, RC. And so we can measure these uh, two radii. So the radius of the drop uh, is, uh, is almost constant. Um, and so if we plot one over RD, we have this orange uh, line here. So it's always negative. So that tells us that the drop is always uh, uh, concave. Um, then the one for the for the column uh, one over RC is actually uh, positive below zero point fifty seven and negative above zero point fifty seven. So if we plot the difference uh, of the two curvature, we have something which is positive for a, a, a region which is larger uh, than this D column, and we can now <coughs> evaluate the wicking rate. So in the experiments, uh, we have we here assume a Darcy's law because we assume everything is from an infinite bath, but obviously the droplet has a finite volume. So it will start as a diffusive behavior, a classical wicking or washburn law, but then quickly the drop volume reduces, so the, the um, uh, pressure decreases until it stops. So we only take the initial uh, stage of the wicking. 
And if we do that, we have a fairly uh, reasonable agreement between the experiments and this uh, model. But more importantly, we can see that as we change the volume, we change the maximum uh, distance at which we can start to initiate the wicking because we, uh, the, the droplets will uh, change sizes and they will change this pressure difference. And so we can actually estimate for each volume what is uh, the distance at which we have the radius of curvature of the drop, which is exactly equal to the radius of curvature of the column. Um, and if we do that, we obtain this blue curve here, which is a very nice uh, limit or boundary for the uh, distance at which we started seeing the transition between drops and column, which is uh, the uh, uh, round points here on this diagram. So we understand that now uh, we have a drop and it will weak of a uh, transition to a column as soon as uh, there is a pressure difference uh, between the droplet and column. However, uh, we don't, uh, we're not explaining completely the upper limit here, which is always a little smaller than square root of two. So we, we cannot form columns up until the square root of two. And this uh, one way of understanding it is that these columns are pretty metastable. And if you look at the radius of curvature uh, close to uh, square root of two, we actually have something which is pretty flat. And, um, and the column, the rate of curvature doesn't change much between uh, 1 and uh, 1.4. And so the transition uh, to drops can occur anytime uh, in this small region here. Um, so now we've seen the droplets uh, on the size of the droplets on the fiber. We have seen that you can have imbibition. Uh, the imbibition time can be um, estimated by um, uh, with a simple scaling argument saying that now the main, uh, the most important uh, radius of curvature is the radius of curvature of the column. Uh, then we can estimate the volume of the drop and we see that the typical wicking time will be the volume square of the drop divided by the distance uh, square between the fiber which is in pretty good agreement with our experiment, uh, which means that as we change uh, the distance between the fibers, we will quickly increase uh, the weaking time. And if we go back to our swelling experiment, we uh, see that if we have a large distance between the fibers, the liquid will remain as a droplet and will not weak and will have uh, times of absorption, which are still pretty high. However, if the fiber are close enough together, we'll have this very quick uh, spreading, uh, which means that the liquid will encounter a lot of dry fiber and we can have this very uh, quick uh, swelling. So I wanna, uh, now I have a few more minutes and I can briefly uh, talk about what's happening uh, in that movie and the other movie. You can see here that the fibers are actually deforming a little bit. And this is because the drop is applying uh, force on the fiber. And uh, the force that the drop is applying on the fiber, uh, we can actually measure. And we did that um, two years ago, where we looked at the force uh, with the force sensor, the force developed as we uh, bring the fiber close together. And so if the fibers are rigid, uh, this force oops, is uh, uh, plotted here uh, below. So here are flexible fibers. Uh, which tells you that the force, there is a force applied by the droplet. Uh, and so we can measure the force as a function of the distance between the fiber, or similarly the force as a function of the length uh, of the liquid. And we see that uh, in the column region, and that is the orange line that you have here, we have this very rapid, this very quick increase of the force with the distance, uh, which makes sense because we can write uh, the force as a function of, uh, of the uh, parameters. It will depend on the length of the fiber as well as of the radius of curvature of the, of the, of the column because there's a component which is a pressure uh, force uh, within uh, the liquid column. And so as we change, as we decrease the distance between the fibers, we both increase uh, drastically the length of liquid, but we also uh, change its radius of curvature here. And so we have this very uh, strong increase of the force as we change the distance. In the droplet uh, region, we have a force which uh, is mostly constant uh, as a function of the distance. And that's because the drop doesn't change shape much as, it, uh, as we change the distance, it remains quite hemispherical. And if we look at the evolution of the force with the length, we have something which is roughly proportional to the length uh, of liquid. So as the first approximation, we can see that the force is proportional to uh, gamma surface tension times the length of liquids. Uh, the prefactor will slightly depend on the volume 
of the droplets and actually will decrease as we increase the volume of the droplets. Um, so now this capillary force is able to apply a force uh, between the fibers and we can have what we call a zipping uh, transition. So you've seen this movie here, we bring the fiber together and at one point we have uh, this uh, quick spreading, but we can also uh, go close to the go close to the time of, um, of zipping and wait, which is the second movie here. So here you see we have a droplet, we're not moving the fibers together and we're just waiting and a drop is uh, applying a force, deforming the fiber, it's spreading and then it quickly zips uh, between the two fibers together. And this we can understand by a balance between the tension within uh, the fibers here. Uh, T that we've already expressed before, and the force applied by the drop, which, as I told you, will be uh, roughly proportional to the length uh, of the droplet here. And so we can have uh, a criteria for the spontaneous zipping that we reach uh, the distance at which uh, we'll have wicking, which is this critical distance equal around 0 0.6. And that tells us that uh, we can have zipping as long as we have a droplet which is large enough to provide the force to beat uh, this tension between the fiber, to bring the fiber together at distance 0 0.6. And this will be controlled by this called so-called um, capillary stretching number that will compare the tension within the fiber, so E and epsilon, which is a pre-strain that we've applied, the radius of the droplets, and uh, gamma surface tension. So I think I'm gonna uh, skip uh, just these uh, two slides to go here now. Um, so that means that we can control this zipping transition by uh, the tension that we apply uh, within the fiber. And so um, if we have a droplet, if we release the tension, the so drop will spontaneously uh, spread and zip uh, the fibers, while as we pull on the fiber, we can go back uh, to a drop. So if we go back to our swelling experiments, which was our initial uh, goal, we can here have a look at this uh, movie. As you recall, as the droplet is absorbing uh, inside the fiber, it will decrease the tension. And this decrease of tension will lead uh, to the zipping uh, of the uh, two fiber and thus uh, spreading and increase of uh, a decrease of absorption time. So we've seen here the swelling helps uh, accelerate actually um, the, the uh, absorption by uh, create, forcing this uh, zipping. Again, I see that I have a couple more minutes to do a detour. I even call it detour. I knew it was going to be a little uh, extra if we had some time, uh, which all of these questions are here, we've only considered a drop on one or two fibers, but this is also relevant to uh, multiple drops on multiple fibers. And one of the applications that we have in mind in these uh, experiments is the uh, filtration of aerosol droplets, which is something, um, again, as we say that we've all become familiar with, with face masks and the respiratory droplets, but has been used uh, for a long time to, uh, for filtration of uh, mists uh, of oil, also to uh, measure uh, meteorological measurements of fog or even to harvest fog for uh, fresh water. And all of this um, uh, filtration is based on inertial impaction. So I'm not going to get into the details of the mechanism here, but this simple idea is that the droplets are carried by the fluids and uh, they will only impact uh, the obstacle, which is a fiber, seen, for example, in this sketch here from the top, if it has enough inertia, that is, if it doesn't follow the streamlines, but uh, keep on uh, keeping its trajectory and go straight. And so everything will be determined by the Stokes number uh, that will compare the time for droplets to uh, go around to uh, be slowed down by viscous effects and so uh, stay in a streamline and the time for it to go around the fiber. I will give you this Stokes number that will tell you at high Stokes number, the droplet will leave the, uh, the streamlines and impact the fiber. And at slow Stokes numbers, it will just uh, follow the streamlines and go be deviated around the fibers. So you always want to try to maximize this Stokes number. And so what I've told you on droplets on fiber is indeed relevant to this question, that if we now take uh, vertical fibers and place them in the mists, uh, which is the first movie that you see here, we start growing droplets on the fiber, which means that the collection surface 
is just these individual droplets and the size of the obstacles the droplets have to go around is the size of the uh, droplets and so we have instead of having just a single fibers we have a single fibers with large obstacle which actually reduces the stokes number and uh, this uh, decrease the um, amount of liquid that can be collected if we now take the exact same experiments but instead of using single fibers we use uh, every time what we call co-fibers or two fibers which are close enough together to be uh, uh, in this region where we start from uh, columns we'll start to see that at the beginning we form these tiny droplets in between the fibers but very quickly uh, the fibers collapse together and form this long liquid column and here even though the movie is still running you don't see any droplets appearing but there is water being collected on this long liquid column and what we've done efficiently is actually transforming uh, our fibers into a super hydrophilic, uh, hydrophilic fiber on which every drop that impacts uh, simply coalesce and is uh, drained down. And this is uh, amazing because now we have a large surface of collection, which is the entire surface of the fiber, but we've kept the size of the fiber minimal. And so we've increased the Stokes number. And that it did what we uh, had measured, that the efficiency of collection, so the amount of liquid that we can capture compared to the amount that we've sent, um, is uh, strong is much uh, uh, higher on these uh, co-fibers or liquid columns and that's something that we've tested also uh, outside in a metallurgical station uh, with measurements of fog collections but i'm not going to get into detail but we have a paper which is in review and will be out uh, hopefully quite soon and so with that uh, i can uh, conclude we've seen how fast the droplet is absorbed by a textile it will depend a lot of on the geometry of the material on the um and on the tension uh, within the material with uh, several um uh, subtle uh things that uh, changing the tension will lead to this deswelling and drop, complex drop motions but will also uh, lead to uh zipping and so increase uh, of the time so you have both effects uh, in your material um, and I will conclude uh, by saying that there's a lot of things to understand with when we look at interactions of fibers and liquids. Uh, here in Princeton, I'm looking at other uh, things related to that, where we look at aggregates of a large number of uh, fiber uh, held together by surface tension. Uh, that's, I will be happy to talk to you more about uh, in another setting, in another time. And I would like to thank uh, everyone I collaborate with, and in particular my uh, four PhD students, Pierre, Hassan, Olivier, and uh, Yossi. And uh, thank you all for listening.